The earth is the Lord's. Everything in creation belongs to God. Lift up your eyes. See the mighty works of the Lord. This is the Lord's house. All who hope in the Lord will be called children of God. Lift up your hearts. Receive the gracious gifts of the Lord. This is the hour for worship and song. Lift up your voice. Praise the Lord with all your might. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Mortals, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. Jesus, the Savior, reigns the God of truth and love. When he had purged our stains, he took his seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. His kingdom shall not fail, he rules o'er earth and heaven. The keys of earth and hell are to our Jesus given. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in glorious hope, Jesus the judge shall come, and take his servants up to their eternal home. We soon shall hear the archangel's voice, the trump of God shall sound, rejoice. Welcome to Mini Jam. It's Miss Jessica and Ivy Hi. and little Lila down here. And today we are continuing with our I Wonder series where we ask a question each week. So just like last week, our question this week is still, I wonder what we can learn from others. And one thing that's really important to learn from others is how much people show you love. Jesus is all about love, he's all about forgiveness, and the best of friends always love and they always forgive you. So when you are around your friends or family and you notice just how loving they are, just how caring they are, talk to them about why they're that way. Talk to them about how they love Jesus, how they pray to Jesus, how they spend time with Jesus each week. So a Bible verse that reminds me of that is Matthew 18 verse 20 and it says, for where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. So when you are with your friends talking about Jesus, learning from others, Jesus is right there. With how we can be become even better friends with Jesus. Find a few friends and ask them about Jesus. Ask what they like about Jesus. How, how he has helped them listen to our stories and share your stories with him as well. Bye. Good morning. Our scripture today is Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us at Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. 
In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he has lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, that he set up in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, believed in him and were marked with the Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we come to our time of prayer today, there are many things to pray for as usual. There are places in the world that have suddenly been plunged into um, a great sea of anarchy and doubt, like in Haiti and in Afghanistan. And we pray that God's presence will be there, especially with those of faith, but with all the people in those countries. We pray that the Lord will be with us in our area, in this part of the world where we are still fighting against the coronavirus and in places in the world where the fight is even more desperate. We ask, Lord, that you help us to give in such a way as to help others to fight this dreaded disease. During this last week, we passed four million people worldwide. Those are the ones that were reported. But four million people who aren't here with us now that, that might have been if it had not been for this disease. And then finally, I wanted to share with you that yesterday I stood out by Highway 153 in the um, cemetery by the grave of Margaret McClure. It's always a strange place to be, a place where a family wants to um, spend a few minutes remembering and worshiping and asking for God's comfort. And, and yet, especially on a Saturday afternoon, there are so many cars going by, and ambulance, motorcycles, big trucks, even a helicopter. And in, then in the midst of all that, Patty McClure stood up, and with great confidence and beauty, sang the Lord's Prayer a cappella. I'm sure the sound around us didn't get any quieter, but it seemed almost to disappear as what happened is I began to feel God's presence even more clearly. So let us pray for those things, for those times when we talk about the thin spaces where the distance between us and God is just a tiny little bit. And when we feel God's presence so strongly, would you pray with me? Oh, Heavenly Father, we pray for our sister Margaret McClure, a longtime member of this church, we pray for her family during their time of grief, and we ask that you would give them comfort in the days and weeks and months to come. There are others in our congregation who are, are facing difficult times, and there are exciting things going on at the same time. 
this week we will begin, not begin, but we will continue our preparations for Vacation Bible School. And this very day, a group of young Boy Scouts headed off to Philmont in New Mexico to try their bodies and perhaps even their souls while they do something that they've never done before. They will see sights and they will have stories to tell that they will retell for a lifetime. And we ask that you would bless them. And Lord, there's so many places where the climate is too hot or the, the climate is too dangerous. There's so many places where there's so much uncertainty, including here sometimes, and, and we need your presence. Help those in Haiti, help those in Afghanistan, help those in troubled places throughout the world, and help us with the trouble that we have in our own heart. We pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, as we look at our two scripture lessons, one is from Mark, and it tells the story of a tragic event, the beheading of John the Baptist. Now, it was a little bit tempting to talk about that story and to compare it to the story of David leading the Ark of the Covenant into the Old into Jerusalem in the Old Testament reading. But I just didn't want to go there today. Those two stories are filled with so much uh, violence and so much death and so much ill repute of relationships that I just didn't want to go there. Instead, I decided to go to Ephesians, and, and we'll come back to Ephesians next week as well as we look at what Paul is writing in what I think are some of his best writings about theology. He here is, is telling us what everything means. There's a, um, a professor at Duke University at the uh, theology school there. And he has a lecture, I think it's entitled, uh, reading the scripture as Ms. Marple. And he says that reading scripture is a little bit like um, reading a murder mystery. You have all these different things going on. You have what you've read and how you respond to that. And then eventually you have Ms. Marple come along who, who says, oh, but this is really what was happening and this is what was meant. And that's what Paul is doing here with us in Ephesians, especially in the first chapter. Now, really, we're going to concentrate on verses 3 through 14. We put in verses 1 and 2 just to be polite. But 3 through 14 is one of the most famous uh, sentences in the Greek New Testament. It's the longest single sentence in the Greek New Testament. It's 200 two words. That's only 70 words shorter than Abraham Lincoln's entire Gettysburg Address, all in one sentence. It's not a very good sentence, but it's still all in one sentence in the Greek. I wish I could diagram a sentence like this, but I have kind of outlined it today, and I wanted to just bring up the points that speak to us. The problem with the sentence is when it's this long, we, we get to the point where we just want to get to the end, and we forget to listen to the actual words and to take the time 
that we need to hear the actual words that are being said, not just to the people in Ephesus years and years ago, but to all of us, to all the people that were before Jesus, to all the people that lived during that time, and to all the people who've lived since then. God is trying to speak a word of truth in our hearts that won't be silenced by anything, not even beheadings and, and broken relationships and all kinds of other things that happen in the world. In verse 3 we start, Blessed be God, our Father, and the Father of Jesus Christ, who, number one, has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It's hard to identify exactly what Paul's talking about here. He could be talking about the, the gifts of the Spirit that he talks about in Galatians. He could be talking about the uh, gifts of the full armor of God that he talks about later in, in Ephesians. He could be talking about uh, the ability to live in whatever kind of situation and to rejoice even in hardship like we find in Philippians. But he's saying that all the blessings of the spiritual realm are given to us. To us. It doesn't seem to me like we're we're necessarily worthy of that. And the truth is, we're not. And it's uh, not something that you should be able to uh, look at and say, oh, I want that, or I want that. Or let me pick the blessings that I want. When we hear the word choose, we want to be the choosers. And yet, it's God who does the choosing. And we'll get back to that in just a minute because it says that he chose us in Christ before the very foundation of the world. He, God, chose us. I know in the world there have been times when I have felt as if I were unchosen that everybody else was getting chosen before I was, or that, that other people got chosen for things that I really wanted for myself, and they could have had this. But it's God who chooses us and gives us the gifts, the spiritual gifts, that, that God wants us to have. But if we get focused on what we got as a gift and, and the fact that we got chosen maybe to do something that we didn't want to do or, or we wanted to be noticed by more people or something, we get past the, the whole idea that God chose us before he even created the world, that there would be a Tony or a Susan or whatever your name is. And that you would be his chosen ones. Chosen, now we've got to be sure that we put this part in. Chosen to be holy and blameless before him in love. It doesn't mean we're not going to make mistakes. It doesn't mean we won't have faults. It doesn't mean that we won't mess up sometimes, because we're going to do that. You know that, and I know that. We know that about each other. But we are called, before the foundations of the world have been made, to be holy, not because of our actions, but because of God's love. That's an astounding statement. And yet, we often just read right past that because we're trying to get to the end of the sentence. That God's love is so powerful 
and it's given just to us and just to everybody else too but but it's given just for me it comes with a gift tag with my name on it and it says you are holy and blameless because of the love that I have for you in Christ I have to stop right here for a second and just talk about the importance of that statement. Because I promise you there's nowhere else in the world where, you'll, where you will find that. And the truth is you won't find that in the church building all the time either. Because we are not all holy and blameless all the time. But when we get it right, we do it so well. I read about a, a church this past week. It, it's a, not a Methodist church. It's an Episcopalian church. It's in New Mexico. I believe that's right. And they decided to work together with a, a company that helps people get over their medical debt. And they, that one church, through their money that they offered and through the efforts of this, this um, mission organization that buys up medical debts from hospitals and then pays it off, just like a collection agency would, except they're not keeping anything for themselves. One church, well over a million dollars worth of debt. And then they, they send a letter to people who have been getting these huge letters with all kinds of threats you know you've got to pay this you've got to pay this or we're going to do these things to you and the letter just said this has been paid you no longer have to struggle under that burden what kind of great love is that that's the church. When we're doing it right, when we can love each other, not, not based on what we decide is right or what, what we think is worthy, but just going through just like the love of God and saying, I love you no matter what. Mary Oliver who is a very fine poet, writes a poem, and it's going to take me a second to find it. It's called Thirst. It goes, another morning, and I wake with thirst for the goodness I do not have. I walk out to the pond, and all the way, God has given us such beautiful lessons. Oh, Lord, I was never a quick scholar, but sulked and hunched over my books past the hour and the bell. Grant me, in your mercy, a little more time. Love for the earth and love for you are having such a long conversation in my heart. Who knows what will finally happen or where I will be sent, yet already I have given a great many things away, expecting to be told to pack nothing except the prayers with, with, with which with this thirst I am slowly learning. One of the reasons we do a prayer of confession in our worship services 
is to remind us that we are not right all the time. That we are not holy, but we desire to be holy. When we get to our prayer of confession today, there are going to be a lot of things there. And, and, and I've had people say to me, I don't like to read those prayers with the rest of the congregation because some of those things don't apply to me. But there are some that do. I challenge you to pay real close attention to the ones that do and then give some consideration to the fact that there are some of the ones that you don't think apply to you that do. I also want to remind you that when we do a prayer of confession, we also do a pardon. This is such an important part of that whole process. Yes, we pray in silence, and that's a time for you to mention those things that you know that that we haven't talked about, that, that you are still struggling with. But then we hear your word spoken. Today, the words of the pardon will, will come from Psalm 24. And that psalm is one of the psalms that, that people headed to the temple used to say, it's one of these psalms of ascension as you walked up the stairs to the temple. Who can stand on God's holy mountain? The person with clean hands and a pure heart. Give us these things, we pray. It's important for us to remember that, that we have been chosen not just to be who we choose to be, but we've been chosen to be holy and blameless through the love of Jesus Christ in our life. There's a phrase that, that jumps out at me. It comes in just a, a little bit. It says that God destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will and to the praise of his glorious grace that he has bestowed on us in the beloved. That, that phrase, um, that it talks about his grace and his glory comes up two more times in this passage. It, it's a, a great way for us to remember that, that we want to live in such a way that it brings joy and praise to God's glorious grace that God has invested in us. We won't be able to cover everything in this section but I'm going to ask you to read it. As a matter of fact, I'm going to ask. And this is sort of like your mother asking. I'm going to ask that you read it at least once a day this week. These 14 verses, it's not that long. But I'd like you to pay attention to a new part of it each day. You choose. But try to look at all the parts of it in these next seven days. And remember the next item. These are some of the things that we have because of God's gracious grace that he gives to us. He says we have redemption through his blood. And we have the forgiveness of our sins. It uses the word trespasses. So Paul must have been Methodist, I'm sure. According to the riches of his grace that he has lavished upon us. We don't use that word nearly enough. But it's perfect when it comes to God's grace. Because he didn't just give us a little bit. 
He didn't just give us a taste of grace. He didn't give us just enough to get us in the door of heaven. He lavished his grace upon us so that our love might be filled with that grace and might be a, a spoken witness into the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From the beginning to the end, it will always be. Holy God, as we come into the presence of your divine holiness, we confess our many shortcomings. Our hands are not clean. Our actions do not glorify you. Our hearts are not pure. Our motivations do not glorify you. Our allegiance is fickle. Our idolatry does not glorify you. By your mercy, O oh God, 
give us hands that are clean, hearts that are pure, tongues that are true, and souls that worship you alone, that our whole lives may glorify you, Father. Would you bow your heads in prayer, silent prayer? Hear the word of the psalmist from Psalm 24. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. I have an announcement to make uh, today at the end of the service that I dread to some extent. Uh, we all dislike change. I want to inform the congregation that Matt Kelly has been offered a wonderful ministry opportunity with Youth for America and has decided to go where our Lord leads. Matt has been here first as our choir director and then as our music director for five years. Before this, Matt Kelly has grown up here as a child of your teaching. Know that when you taught him in Sunday school or, or in youth or in some other setting, you were in some ways preparing him for this day. So let us rejoice for Matt and Celeste and Elizabeth for the mission that God has put in front of him. He will be with us for several more weeks, so there will be time to say our thank yous and our goodbyes soon. But for now, we rejoice in what God is doing in his heart and in his future. All you who seek God and who have set your hope on Jesus Christ, hear the good news. We have received forgiveness of sins according to the riches of God's grace. As forgiven and beloved children of God, let us set our hope on Christ and live for the praise of his glory. Go forth in peace. Amen.